Once I have your heart completely destroyed by a nice little animated movie, then boy, do I have a treat for you today on today's episode of that song from that movie. Holy moly. Guacamole? Yes. Ooh. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for joining that song for that movie, The Journey Through the Very Best and Worst of Movie Songs. I am your, he's got big ears, so they call him a freak, host Dietrich, and we're joined by the most stupendous, magnificent, super colossal spectacle, Alex. If only can live up to that, <laughs> to that intro. It was, uh, it was difficult that when school teachers insisted on that introduction every time he walked into the room. Well, it was on the register, wasn't it? Mm, it was half yeah. of the <laughs> Why? <laughs> His surname is Alex. <laughs> yeah. And we're also joined by the elephant who the whole circus is very proud of, Ben. Uh, I don't want to say that. I mean, it's nowhere near what Alex's was. Yeah, I mean, usually he's the elephant in the room, isn't he? Mm. Yeah. Oh, was that that joke? <laughs> <laughs> what have you been watching this week? Um, I have been watching a TV show called It's a Sin. Have you guys watched this? No. I have not, no. but I I thought you were going to watch it, so I waited to see what your opinion of it was. <laughs> well, I thought it was very good. It's like a new um, Russell T. Davis TV show about eight. Please don't start singing the song from Team America. No, <laughs> it was, was not. No, it was not. Was yeah. <laughs> nope, no. Pass I assume that. it's more serious than that. Oh, it's much more serious than that. I, I mean, it is. It does have you know, it's light hard moments. It's kind of like a, it's sort of like a semi comedy. It's not. It's not like laugh out loud, but. Um, yeah, I would recommend it. I don't want to talk too much about it because, one, it will upset me. <laughs> and, and two, I don't want to ruin any, any of it. But um, for anyone who has seen it, episode three, you know you know what I'm talking about. Totally, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What about you, Ben? Uh, I watched a, a film called The Hunt. Have you heard of that? Not the Norwegian one that's miles, miles better than the one I watched this week. <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of like some weird... I th- it's one of those films that's trying to make a huge commentary on people being, uh, how should we say, um, too liberal. What, they like a cult or something? Well, it, they're basically a rounding up... Pe- it's a very sort of Hunger Games, Battle Royale-esque, in which they round up people who are... Well, yeah, I can't explain it without giving it away, but it's terrible, don't watch it. Okay. <laughs> so you're not going to give it away, but we also should Well, no, some people might enjoy it. There was parts I enjoyed. Most of it I didn't enjoy. 7 out of 10. <laughs> Andy, Andy, Andy Lau. Lau. Andy Lau, <laughs> 7 out of 10. To understand that reference, please watch our Departed episode by 2D. This week I watched the new, well, new to the UK Star Trek TV show, Star Trek Lower Decks on Amazon Prime. Is that the animated one? Yes. Any good? Yes. And it's it, it's really good. Oh, okay. it, much, it's so much better than you expect it to be when someone said, they've done like a sort of Rick and Morty Star Trek TV show. It actually is pretty good when it sounds crap when you describe it that way. Yeah. Yeah. I wondered whether it looked, the animation looked a bit like Final Space. After the first episode, there was a reference to some guy called Gary, and I assumed <laughs> it was a reference to Final Space. Yeah. Final Space is very good. The first season was very good. Yeah, the second season, not so much. No, but the first season was very, very, very good. Today's episode is the songs of Disney's heartbreaking tale, Dumbo. So to find out what was happening in the world when the movie came out, over to you, Ben. Yeah, let me take it away. So yes, we are going back to October 1941 and World War II, as I have talked about already in these two Disney episodes, is still very much raging on. As Germany begins their war on two fronts, moving through France and trying to quickly take Russia, a decision that some historians have since deemed a bad move. (laughs) <laughs> US President of the time Franklin D. Roosevelt approves the atomic program that would later be known as the Manhattan Project, changing the face of energy, weaponry, and everything in between for the rest of eternity. Away from the animated movies, the Maltese Falcon was released, directed by John Huston and starring Humphrey Bogart and Mary Astor, which, for those unaware, basically is often referenced as being the first major film noir. And everyone should go and watch it because it is fantastic. I concur. Good, Alex. Always rely on you. <laughs> And finally, the big four faces of the American presidents we all know as Mount Rushmore is finished, with the mugs of Washington, Jefferson, Roosevelt and Lincoln gracing the South Dakota mountainside, becoming equal parts, a monument to the greats of those that have held office, and a complete disregard for the Native Americans that called those hillsides their home. I always like to end on a nice positive beat. (laughs) And also we have Dumbo. So, 
18 months after the release of Disney's Pinocchio and 11 after the orchestrated anthology that is Fantasia, we were gifted the classic sob story of the elephant with the unusually large ears who touched our hearts for many years. So, we have all seen this film, yes? Yes, absolutely. Yes. I assumed by your reference of heartbreaking that you had, D. Just checking in that Alex did have a childhood. I did. <laughs> good, good to know. <laughs> Back to me, Ben. What are your thoughts then, up front? So sad. It's so sad. That's a happy ending. I'm too, too far gone then. <laughs> you never make it that far. <laughs> Is this the first time you're hearing about it? I thought the film ended after the uh, the mother and Dumbo scene. I can't remember what the mother's name is. Mrs. Jumbo. It is. It is literally Mrs. Jumbo. Yes. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. <laughs> Which it kind of, I think, kind of like detracts from the sadness of it somehow. <laughs> it does a bit. Yeah. It's weird. Like you're living in some sort of weird nihilistic childhood where you were only allowed to watch the sad parts of, of animated films. Dean. <laughs> Could you imagine? Yeah. Just I like bam- the idea that bam- your mum like taped over the other parts that so you didn't actually know they existed. <laughs> yeah, it was taped over with the Channel Tunnel news report. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> Good reference. Good reference. It was just an anthology, one VHS that Dee had, where it was like Bambi up to the point which they get shot, but then they cut loads of it out and there's still the fire. <laughs> They're still throwing the fire apart. Exactly. Yeah, there's the scene from Up, just repeated various times, slowed down as well. <laughs> um, fun fact, Dumbo was the first Disney film to be released on VHS. That is a fun fact. That sounds made up. Uh, I, d- I found it. It was a fact, so someone might have made it up and I've taken it as a fact. <laughs> what year was it? Uh, I don't have that fact. I was wondering how expensive it was, because if you remember from the Ghostbusters episode, VHS is used to cost like 70 quid. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if it's it available on VHS, but you have to remortgage your house to buy it. <laughs> yeah, so like we've talked about Snow White already. We've talked about Pinocchio. We skipped over Fantasia because it doesn't have lyrical songs really to discuss. Dumbo, the fourth Disney film so far. Where's it standing then in your eyes? In those first four? Yeah, we've got those first four. Where's it stand? It's the best one. It's the best best one? By a long way. (laughs) By a long way. Is that because (laughs) it literally touches an hour? (laughs) It's just over, isn't it? I just think it's the... I don't know. I just just think it's the one from this period that really sticks with me. And I know the songs. Like, you always ask us which songs do we know from the films. And I think, quite frankly, at the moment, I'm performing quite poorly in knowing uh, how <laughs> what songs are from which films. But with this one, I think you said there were six songs, and I knew four of them straight off the bat. Oh, wow, so amazing. Well done. Confident. Well, I think I know four songs. <laughs> I have subsequently listened to them, and they do exist. So, yeah, I think it's the best of those four, and it's probably up there with one of the best ones just ever. Okay. D, can go. Yeah, I think so. Definitely best of the four, well, three we've done, plus Fantasia. And, yeah, I would, I'd probably put it at least in the top five of all-time Disney classics. Wow. When you say Disney classics, is that when does classics end? As in, what Disney has told me is classics, okay. as in the Walt Disney Animation Studio films. Okay. The ones yes. where, they, where they have a little number on the yes, DVD yes, case. Yes. Yep. Yeah, I'd probably say it's the best of the four so far as well. Although, I might come to this, soundtrack-wise, I don't think so. And we will touch upon that later. So yeah, a little bit of facts about Dumbo before we go into the soundtrack. So as we touched on a little bit in the Pinocchio episode, the war as in World War Two, was having, a, for those of you who weren't aware, it was having a detrimental effect on Disney. Both Pinocchio and Fantasia bombed on their initial releases, basically because no one was going to the cinema. Dumbo was originally intended as a short film based on the children's story by Helen Abison Mayer and Harold Pearl, but Walt Disney, he kind of had a, an interest in it and thought, well, why don't we make a feature-length version give it the full treatment, but just make a cheaper version. So they cut back on a lot of the sort of special effects and cool sort of techniques they developed in the earlier films and just try to do a very basic film. Partly why this is a much shorter film. A lot of studios, I think, on release didn't like that. And a lot of production companies, um, sorry, distribution companies rather, wanted it to be extended. But Walt Disney was like, no, if you extend it, you, there's, there's nothing else to fill. You end up with another Pinocchio. Yeah, basically. Yeah, that is just too long. And on its release, it was dubbed a financial miracle. Don't know who gave it that moniker, but it's a decent, decent title to go with. Uh, so at a cost of just shy of one million, it made a profit of 850000 So at the time, it's quite a lot. I don't have inflation figures, but I think that's fairly decent. 
The Financial Miracle was my original nickname. So, so it sounds like a rap, like a rap title. <laughs> financial Miracle. AKA Financial Miracle. <laughs> it does look like a rap name. But yes, the Dumbo soundtrack was released alongside the film with songs by Disney staples Frank Churchill and Oliver Wallace. It won the award for Best Original Score at the Oscars and was nominated for Best Original Song, which we will get into. So, we have six songs in total in the Dumbo soundtrack. Alex, you said you could name four. D, how many could you name? I could name three and knew there was a fourth one, but I didn't know it was called. Okay. After listening to them, do you know which one that was then? Yeah, it was Baby Mine. I, did, I just didn't know yeah. what it was called off the top yeah. of my head. So, Alex, I think you might win this then, because I only remembered three. Ooh. And I think even listening back, I think it was four maybe in actually going through that. Like, oh, yes, I remember this. Two. I haven't got a clue. And I still don't. <laughs> even with my notes in front of me, I have no idea what I'm talking about. So there was only one that I didn't recognise. Is that the first one, Alex? Um, it depends, because I'm guessing the first one is Mr. Stork. Is that wrong? Right? He, he is right. <laughs> Well, then I knew that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, yeah, let's get into it. So, the first song in Dumbo is Look Out for Mr. Stork, as a team of storks are spending the night delivering babies to various circus animals. Throughout it, all the animals receive babies from the storks, except for Mrs. Jumbo, the mother of our titular Dumbo, who has to wait a little longer for hers. So, it's performed by the Sportsman Quartet, which basically do a lot of the group songs in the film. It is a very short song. It's only one verse and a quick tempo, which is repeated once after a, kind of a spoken interlude. But yeah, what are your thoughts of this? I literally I had no idea about this song. I knew the Storks delivered Dumbo at the start of the film. Could remember there was music over it. Even listening back to it, I watched the film two nights ago. I can't remember this. <laughs> you can't remember. Yeah, I thought this was like an orchestral piece. I couldn't remember any lyrics. Yeah, so exactly I was the same. a little surprised when I uh, looked at the list and that was there. Yeah, I, I don't know, listen, listening to the song and looking back at the lyrics, it's a bit odd. It's a bit creepy. I it think. is just a bit creepy, isn't it? Yeah, it felt like um, it felt like a sort of TV advert from the time, but like warning of some sort of cre- creepy stalker man. Definitely. <laughs> well, the word obviously has the word stalk in there, that's spelled differently. So. <laughs> but <laughs> it's just like, watch out for Mr. Stalk. He's round the corner. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah, I didn't remember that this song was in it. Obviously, I remember the stalk bit, but then when I heard it, I was like, oh yeah, I know this, because I feel like on one of the old VHS of one of the Disney films, not Dumbo, I think they used to put, like, collections of, like, songs from other films in them, because that's why I know Zippity Doo Dah, because I used to be on one of Mr. Stork slash the second song, which I won't name yet, because we can go into it, were both on one of those, where it was like, it played mm-hmm. those two songs, and then, like, a collection of other songs. I can't remember which Disney VHS it was. And it always just have an advert for um, Davy Crockett in the live action Disney movie. <laughs> <laughs> it's a clever way of marketing, I guess. I mean, I had many Disney sing-along VHSs as a kid. Yeah. This was not on it. <laughs> uh, and in fact, I don't think many songs in, in Dumbo were on it. I don't think the some of the more sombre, slower songs would find their way onto a sing-along book. <laughs> But yeah, this song to me is predatory. (laughs) There's such lyrics as, don't try and get away, he'll find you anyway. It should be like a song used on like a contraceptive advert. It did sound like something that someone would have, you know, subverted and used in like a creepy word and like a creepy version of. So I'm surprised that hasn't like found its way into something. (laughs) But that was my first thought as well, was that it was creepy, but it's obviously not supposed to be. So I don't know why it comes across that way. I think it's the sort of, the barbershop quartet approach to singing died out a long time ago. And I think there's something about the recording style of it, almost kind of the crackling bass. It's quite unusual to sort of modern ears. And I think it, that part of it creeps me out a bit. I don't know if that if that's just kind of like a general feeling, but I kind of know the first half of Dumbo, I ain't really going to enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> I've learned to realise I can't get away because <laughs> it will find me anyway. I just, I just like looking at the lyrics myself and the last sort of couple of lines. It's useless to resist. Remember those quintuplets and the woman in the shoe? Maybe he's got his eye on you. I don't know if that's a reference to the woman in the shoe. Not a clue. Isn't that, a, is that like a Wait. nursery story? Yeah, I think oh, that's like a nursery woman. rhyme or something. She Hasn't she got like a thousand children? Oh, maybe. Maybe she's got five. I think she had more than that. I will quickly skip past that song because it ain't one of the best ones. It ain't even a good one. Nope. Whereas... <laughs> On the other hand, this song's a banger. So, the second <laughs> song in the film <laughs> is Casey Jr. 
This song plays when the train of the same name is chugging throughout the US towards the next circus event. Again, it's only two verses, one chorus and a reprise, but acts as a musical refrain throughout. Now, I've already said, this song is great. It's a proper earworm. Yes. Watching it, playing it back on YouTube, the amount of times I've just been going through the day going, Casey Jr.'s coming round the track. It just gets stuck in my mind, that one line, over and over and over again. There's nothing I can do about it. Yeah, I'm, I'm exactly the same. I don't know about you, Alex. Yeah, it's just an absolute tune. I did wonder, though, whether it inspired Daft Punk. What do you think? The um, horn on the top is doing the uh, the whole... It sounds like that. Uh, so... yeah, uh, what, robot rock? <laughs> yeah. I, th- I think they stole that from this. I mean, Daft Punk are heavy on sampling, so maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know the part I mean, though, where the whole I know like which talking. part you mean. Yeah, sampling became a lot more expensive in the early nineteen nineties, so a lot of artists go really obscure on sampling or pay through the nose. So maybe Daft Punk secretly sampled some weird Disney <laughs> tunes and jingles to get around paying for it. You onto something here, Alex? Well, maybe, yeah. I mean, I was kind of <laughs> suggesting that they were inspired by it rather than sample. Literally, right now, it's, in, it's on the but, internet, Alex. You know, it's on the internet. Yeah, going around. So. You'll be getting called by like, the Daily Mirror or something. I had said nothing. Said I had said nothing. <laughs> Alex, if that song from that movie calls out Daft Punk. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you won't even know they're approaching you because no one knows what they look like. <laughs> Come and get you. Yeah, what do you think about this song, Dave? I mean, it's, it's great, isn't it? It's, once you hear it, it's stuck in your head. And of course, it reminds me of being at Disneyland Paris. Yes, definitely. And you go on the, the Casey Jr. right at the back. Yep. So I'm assuming this was one of the songs you guys remembered. Yes. Yes. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Interestingly, it wasn't one of mine. <laughs> when I told my wife that I was doing this episode on, on Dumbo, this was the song she sang at me. I'd forgotten about this, but it's clearly stuck in my mind. <laughs> so does anyone know what Casey Jr. is referencing? Because it does. A train. Have uh, kind of. It was the obvious go-to. It was the obvious guess. go-to guess, yes. And I'm glad, as the smart ass that you are, I was wrong. <laughs> so Casey Jr. Know. is a reference to Casey Jones, who was a famous railroad engineer in the States who lost his life in a train collision in 1900. So basically, I think he'd worked a full day shift and then was doing a late sort of through the night train. Potentially was a bit tired at the wheel, but... In order to avoid a sort of a head-on collision, which may have caused a lot of casualties, he managed to divert it enough in which basically the only death was himself. I guess avoided a lot of casualties. There's also slight references throughout the song, the I think I can, I think I can, to the children's story, The Little Engine That Could, yeah. which was a VHS that I had as a child and would watch repeatedly. Because God, I love trains. <laughs> Still do. No, now it's just transport. Just a film. <laughs> God, I love drugs. <laughs> but straight after this song, almost as soon as it's finished, we are given the third song in Dumbo, which is called Roosterbouts, also known as the Song of the Roosterbouts, which is the third song from the film and performed by The King's Men, apparently. No connection to the upcoming film. So, yeah, it is sung when Casey Jr. stops at another spot, puts his wheels aside, rests up for the night, while the railroad workers and circus animals help set up the circus tent for the circus to perform at the area they have stopped. It's quite an interesting song and scene in the film. There's probably a general discussion surrounds Dumbo around similar themes Mm -hmm. about race um, at the time. And I think this is kind of the first sort of reference to or where we could discuss that in this film. But I don't know what your general thoughts are about this song. The brightness and the cheeriness of Casey Jr. is very quickly demolished in this yeah. scene. And it's like, no, this is the uh, the life of living in this circus. <laughs> it's pretty grim. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. But I mean, I think all of the, certainly the earliest Disney ones had this element of sort of like gritty darkness about them. Mm-hmm. And I think this is the first note that you get of it really in this one. And it kind of stays at this level for a little bit of the film, doesn't it? For like a good like portion of it. There's like a lot of darkness in it before it gets happy again. <laughs> yeah. This song is just the gateway into that world. Yeah. What do you think, Dave? Well, you've both sort of alluded to it there. It sort of does sound like the kind of song you expect African slaves to sing mm-hmm. whilst on a like a plantation or something like that whilst working. I can't remember what those type of songs are called off the top of my head, but that's what it sounds like. And it really does carry that weight. 
Yeah, I don't know what I don't know what they're called. I mean, it, to me, it sounds like a like a railroad song, you know, like a, a chain gang song. Yeah, like lyrics like obviously we slave until we're almost dead, yet we're happy hearted roostabouts. Dumbo is kind of unusual in that the, there is an argument about the use of race in the film, and it's not, I think, like Song of the South, where it is mostly overly critical. There is a sort of disclaimer when you watch Dumbo on the Disney Channel that there might be sort of outdated views, which I think it should have. But I think it's quite interesting, the discussion that you can have around it. So this song, for people who might be unaware, it is very dark. There is rain lashing down. The elephants are helping sort of move the carts while there are the work hands basically of the circus, which although they they basically have no physical features, but they're all black. And they're basically singing this song. The lyrics kind of make it sound like they basically have nothing going for them, yet they're fine and happy. However, there's a line at the end of the song which says, Swing that sledge, sing that song, work and laugh the whole night long, you happy-hearted roosterbouts. To me, that sounds like it's a almost like echolalic repetition of what someone's saying to them, almost like a command. Whether the song is therefore tongue-in-cheek, it's that, singing about how hard they have it and that, well, yeah, we're just forced to smile. Or you could obviously take it in the opposite sense that it's, well, yeah, this is the best what we can get and we're and we're happy with that. Yeah, I mean, I, I would be inclined to take it the latter because mm-hmm. of Song of the South, which I think might be, is it the next film? I feel like it's... Uh, it's maybe, that or Bambi. But anyway, because of the, the nature of that film and the way um, the slaves are represented in that, Yes. I would think that actually yeah, it's the latter, that it's sort of like they are happy to just live this life. And mm-hmm. this is this is the life they've been afforded and that's what they're going to do. It's more likely it is that way. and But I think this song, maybe because it's not as famous, there's no criticism in this element. Whereas I think the crows are obviously the focus of a lot of the criticism of race in the film. Yeah, This is the first Disney film that is of present day. You know, I assume it is set at the time and it's set in America, whereas Snow White is, you know, very much fairy tale. Pinocchio is European, we assume. Fantasia is not set in sort of... <laughs> are you saying those guys in the orchestra are not really there? <laughs> well, they're not really. <laughs> so this is the first one that kind of has to comment on the day-to-day lives of American people. At the very least, it is interesting to see how the film dealt with that. So moving on to the latter half of songs in the film. The fourth song, Baby Mine, sung by the off-screen voice of Betty Noise, is heard while Dumbo is visiting his mother, who is locked up in solitary confinement. Now, much of the comments heartbreaking, you know, sob story, are related to this song, in my opinion. This is an incredibly sad scene. Yep. What do you guys think? Honestly, when I went to watch it, I got about seven seconds in and started to tear up and decided to turn it off at that moment. <laughs> so I've not listened to it in a little while because I can't get myself to get all the way through it. Mm-hmm. Alex? I did make it through the song. Um, I made it through several versions of the song, actually. <laughs> just, <laughs> just to show you up, Dee. Because I'm so mad. But yeah, because there was a new version by Arcade Fire, interestingly, for the, for the new there film. There is, yeah. Is that going to be the only mention of the new film that we have in this? The new version? I, I really didn't version. want to mention it. So I listened to that version as well, and I enjoyed that version. Because the version from the film, even though I remember the name of the song roughly how it went, it, well, it didn't actually it didn't stick. I didn't remember it as well as I remember like Casey Jr., for instance. <laughs> All I remembered mainly was the scene itself rather than the song. Like with the trunk coming through the bars of the carriage and yeah. you know, like rocking him with with her trunk, it's all very emotional. And then like he has her, like a trunk is like waving goodbye, and it says like mad elephant on the side of the carriage. She's, like, She's not mad. She's not mad. <laughs> she just loves her baby. And the song has featured in countless TV shows and films as like nursery rhymes or like lullaby songs to kids. It is kind of been represented as a love song from a mother to their child. There's been a lot of famous versions of the song. The Arcade Fire one I have also listened to, and I do think it is very good. But I do like Arcade Fire. There's a famous version by Bette Midler in the film The Beaches. Have you seen the film? No, but I know the film. (laughs) Also, it's No, I've not seen it. Something we may cover at some point on this podcast, Mm. because there is an absolute jam of a song in it. Pure (laughs) Shaws. That would be odd. (laughs) 
but also a song from the film Beach. It's, uh, yeah, that was the joke. That was the joke. Oh, the beach, you mean? <laughs> the beach, sorry. Yeah. I just assumed you referenced it because it had chores. <laughs> no. Moss Rebel. A lot of these jokes, I'm so zoned in into my notes that these little quips and jabs and little clever jokes you make do straight over my head. I enjoy the fact you call them clever. I will take that. <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> All we're doing here is trying to avoid talking about this song because it's too sad. <laughs> yeah, classic avoidance thing. So as soon as the song came out, there was a lot of different versions done by quite famous singers at the time. Les Brown, Glenn Miller, Jane Froman. There's all versions that did well in the charts in America. Slight different takes, but nothing too drastically different. All of them still picking on the same emotional notes that comes with the song. It is incredibly sad. I really like this song. Uh, and this was the song that was nominated for Best Original Song at the Oscars. It did not win. The name of the film or song that did win, I've never heard of the film. And I think, well, I guess that's just a testament to Disney, just how much these things can last. I, I can't really quote on whether this song should have won, because I, most of those songs I'd never heard of. But Betty Noyes was quite famous at the time as well for being a ghost singer. Very famously, she was the ghost singer. Do people know what we mean by ghost singer? Yeah, she died, but she can still sing <laughs> from beyond the grave. Exactly, sure, yeah, ex- exactly. Yeah, uh, sang a song in the movie Ghost. <laughs> Did she do the original version of Unchained Melody? She was in the Matrix Reloaded. <laughs> Any more? <laughs> no, carry on. So let me ask the question again, guys. Do you know what a ghost singer is? Yeah, we just explained it. <laughs> No, yeah, it's, it's where you're not you're the person who sings over famous actresses. I think, was it Natalie Wood in um, West Side Story, maybe? Mm-hmm, she like mm-hmm. famously didn't sing. So I think it's that kind of thing. It's live action stuff. They usually always like a kind of a ghost singer for animated <laughs> film. But, well, can you? Maybe it's exactly what it is. But... Can you think of any other famous examples? Um, I'm sure there must be. Embarrassing. Oh, um, Go on. I was gonna, sorry, I was going to say in The Greatest Showman. I know that... Um, yes. Rebecca Ferguson. Rebecca Ferguson doesn't sing, does she? Mm-hmm. I know that. I mean, I mean, who, who, not many people could sing that song. I was <laughs> no, also thinking of no. that Eurovision, that Eurovision, Will Ferrell Eurovision film. <laughs> I don't think Rachel <laughs> McAdams sings a song in that film either. No. Embarrassingly, the most the example that came to my head was Zac Efron in the first High School oh, Musical. Uh, yes, yeah, yes. Wait, what? Yeah, because you not know? Did you not know that? Yeah, yeah. I was living in a slightly more magical world where Zac Efron sang that song. No, that's why but... when they did the live tour, it's all the original cast apart from Zac Efron. Someone else plays exactly. the role of whatever that character's called. I just assumed it because he was a big star. <laughs> nope, it was because he couldn't okay. sing, but he sang but... for the second and third film. Don't worry, really. exactly. Yeah, and and he had like a really similar voice, so it was weird. <laughs> it was like, this is where like... all our listeners are turned off. <laughs> no, it's not. This is um... where we've gained new listeners. People, they just, the fans of the High School Musical just know when you're talking about it. Betty Noyes was famous <laughs> for being the ghost singer of Debbie Reynolds for two songs in Singing in the Rain. Ironically, in which Reynolds plays a ghost singer for someone else in the film. <laughs> it's like a songception thing. And this is the best fact, because we've got to throw in a Grammy fact because of how stupid the Grammys are. Alison Krauss was nominated for a Grammy for Best Female Country Vocal Performance for a version of this song. What a terrible category. Anyway, <laughs> simple as that. I just got. I hate the I was surprised. I hate the Grammys. It must go on for about t- longer than Lent. <laughs> anyway, the fifth song of Dumbo, which is one of the best scenes, "Pink Elephants on Parade," performed by Mel Blanc, Phil Ravenscroft. Have we had that name before? Because we've had a lot <gasps> yes, of incredible. We have. He was the guy from The Grinch. Was that really? There yeah. You go. Phil Ravenscroft. How could you forget the name? It's, it's insane. And the Sportsman Quartet once again. Now, this is a nearly all instrumental musical number, and it centres on the imagery and nightmarish pink elephant hallucinations seen by Dumbo and Timothy while they're getting a bit crunk. (laughs) I think that's the right word, isn't it? I think that's what it said in the Disney footnotes. I love this scene. It's like the animators, the the reins were taken off and they could just do whatever they wanted. And if if you kind of place it in time as well, early 1940s. It's so unusual. Like, even probably animation at the time, like cartoons, you know, going back to the Disney's own sort of short animation. This is weird. <laughs> this is very <laughs> weird. And incredibly creative. I don't think anything had been done like this before, and it's probably the blueprint for a lot of surreal nightmare fever dream scenes. I, I watched this, the, I think probably the main reason I remember most of the songs because I watched it not that long ago, like a couple of years ago. And the part I was waiting for the entire film was this part because like, I remember this vividly and I remember it being horrifying <laughs> in a great <laughs> way. 
and yeah, it is. I rewatched it again earlier, and it's amazing. And and it's like four or five minutes long, which is great because that's essentially like a tenth of the film. Is this scene. <laughs> <laughs> it's, good. it's a good point. Yeah, but there's just so much random stuff in it. Like there's uh, some salsa dancing with lightning bolts. Yep. There's 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 a part where there's an elephant doing an heroic belly dance, <laughs> and a stomach turns into an eyeball. Yep. Why? It's a James Bond intro. <laughs> well, I mean, it would. This would be better. I wonder whether a lot of them were inspired by this. I really do. So much stuff going on in there. Do you want to hear my opinion, or do you want to hear the opinion of Defining Disney Podcast? Oh, yes. Yeah, I mean, yeah. That, it, and you should have said that from the start. <laughs> you didn't even need you. you. should have said them on. Yeah, we should at some point. Right, here we go. Though it's not necessarily the Dumbo song with the most staying power, Pink Elephants on Parade is probably the most fun. Full of fantastical imagery, set to a rhythm that just makes you want to bounce in your seat, it's an earworm that easily gets stuck in the heads of parents and kids alike. It starts off very traditionally orchestral, but varies throughout the tune with different instrument groups, including a dip in the Middle Eastern instrumentation, particularly with some wind instruments in the belly dancing elephant interlude. And it also gives the audience a quick peek into the mind of Dumbo and the things he dreams about, which is especially important since he never has a single line of dialogue. I want to know where Dumbo's been, that he dreams about salsa dancing. <laughs> That was my main takeaway from that. First of all, like that's probably the first time anyone on this podcast has sort of analysed like music... musical conjunction. Yeah. yeah, the musicality of any songs definitely that deserves an applause. Yeah, they're doing the job better than we can <laughs> yeah, in that one ten yeah. seconds. We're going like... to have to cut that. <laughs> so thank you there to Defining Disney for sending that clip in. You can find them on Twitter at Defining Disney. Check them out. No, it was really interesting on that. I'm picking up on one thing because they said it was an earworm. The instrumental, I think, is slightly like the marching beat, but it's the visuals that stick in my mind rather than the song. Like, I think a lot of people remember Pink Elephants on Parade. I know it's been reused in like the Heffalumps and Woozle scene in Winnie the Pooh. I think this is hu- this is huge, famous in Disney history. I don't think the song is. You know, I'm interested to what you guys think. I kind of understand why you, why you say that because I think it's the visual element of it that really does like vividly stick in the mind. But I think like especially just the like elephants on parade, you know that. Like yeah, to a, to <laughs> that, a marching like, beat that just never will never leave. Yeah. I suppose though, linking on from um, is it the Sorcerer's Apprentice? Is that what that's part yes, called yes. in Fantasia? Yeah, with the walking brooms. Yeah. So I get, I get. It's visually, it's not too far away from the from some of the stuff that happens in Fantasia, actually. So maybe that's kind of where it comes from. Whereas this is just like, yeah, like you said, they've been given like free reign mm-hmm. to. If if Dumbo was having some sort of psychedelic trip right now. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, like. basically. And a lot of the animators of the film actually left Dumbo because there was a huge writer's strike. And I think they're actually at parts in, it's either this scene or there's another scene, and they mock them. The animators that left, they put them, like the uh, caricatures of them in the film um, in different ways to kind of laugh about how they went, they decided to go for a raise and guess what? They lost their jobs. So that's a nice bit of gentle ribbing again from Disney. But yeah, a lot of film critics, and I've seen this mentioned a dozen times in various books, but one I remember in particular, Leonard Matlin, who's a very famous movie critic in the States, believed this to be the best movie scene ever to be put on film, which, you know, is a claim. Don't think I'd go that far. Bold shout. Yeah, yeah, bold shout. But I think when you're a critic, you kind of need those bold shouts, I think, to stand out. But yeah, I think it is incredibly influential to what animation can do. Before digital effects could mix and mash sort of reality with fiction, you went to animation to kind of do what nothing else could be done. And I think this is the first example of it. Mm. A huge part of movie history. And just imagine like what it looked like on screen in 1940. Was it this film? 1941. 41. It must have looked incredible. Yeah, definitely. So the sixth and final song in Dumbo is probably the most famous. So sung by Cliff Edwards and the Hal Johnson Choir, we have... When I See an Elephant Fly. In the film, it's performed by the crows while making fun of Timothy Mouse's idea of a flying elephant. There is a reprise of the song, which is performed at the end of the film, when Dumbo becomes a circus star using his flying skills as he reunites with his mother and the crows bid him farewell as the train leaves. So, what do you guys think of this song? I mean, I made a claim. I think this is the most famous song in the film. I think you're probably right. I know I'm right, Alex. I just wanted you to tell me. (laughs) Oh, you son of a... The thing that, when I watched it, that it made me think of straight away was like, this is the kind of first foray into um, jazz scat that Disney did. Because it seems to be something that crops up quite a lot. 
obviously they do it in Jungle Book with I Want to Be Like You and mm-hmm. Aristocats as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is like the beginning of that phase for Disney where they just sort of throw in these random jazz songs. Yeah. Interestingly, like a lot of the songs that weren't jazz songs we've kind of covered before became jazz standards. Like there was a few songs in Snow White and Pinocchio which yeah. became jazz standards. So it must be it must be something of the tempo and the beat that is transferable to jazz. Mm. This this song obviously stands out because other than I suppose the what was it the rooster about the rooster about other than that one this is basically the only one that's sung by characters in the film yeah which is odd isn't it I think you you need some dialogue <laughs> obviously you've got Timothy Mouse <laughs> who, Timothy. I'm pretty sure Timothy Mouse is this is voiced by the same person who did Jiminy Cricket well it's essentially the same character isn't yeah it, basically ones. yeah yeah <laughs> yeah what do you think Dave? it's slightly uncomfortable viewing in a uh, 2020 well 2021 context. But I don't think this is that memorable of a song, to be honest, compared to the other ones we've already had. So, Do you think part of it's the fact that it's called When I See an Elephant Fly, and that's kind of a main plot point in the film, that he can fly? I don't know if that's just people just remember this because of that, or what. I, I don't really know why, other, other than it's quite different to every other song in the film. So maybe that made it stand out at the time. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm with Dee. I, when I listened to them all earlier, this one wasn't one of the ones where I was like, oh yeah, I enjoyed this. Yeah, it doesn't really resonate. No, it's, it, no. like I say, if you ask me, what are the lyrics? <laughs> Other than saying, when I see an elephant fly, it's not a catchy song, but it's the one that, what's the famous song from Dumbo? I think this. It's quite weird, but I think because of the, the recording style of the song, if you watch it back, the voices don't move with the mouths, and I think they just, again, with the budget cuts, they just didn't try and edit it properly. So a lot of different voice actors and singers are used for interchanging of the characters. So it's kind of an all sort of mishmash and mess. But yeah, I don't think it's one that, as much as I associate this with Dumbo, it's not one I'd listen to. I'm not going to find it on a Disney album or compilation. So top five. You want to do top five? Let's do this. As we've kind of just picked up a little bit of, there's not a lot of dialogue in this film. Dumbo actually has zero. And I'm pretty sure Mrs. Dumbo, Dumbo's mother, only has one line when she says, it's Dumbo. According to a random poll I found on an internet <laughs> website. Oh, I love a random poll. What are the top five Disney characters with no spoken words? The cricket. <laughs> what, in Mulan? God, yeah, in Mulan. <laughs> Apparently, no. No. Oh, no. What? Does Bambi's mother speak? Does Bambi speak? Yes, yeah, it says Bambi says bird. Bird. Hey, bird. <laughs> Come on, Alex. Uh... D, what do you all... Dumbo. There you go. <laughs> what do you always forget to do? <laughs> Guess what's number one? Dumbo. Okay, you've got four more. God, this is, this hard, is hard. Oh, wait, does... does oh, well, the little mermaid speaks when she's in the water, doesn't she? <laughs> yes, she, speaks, she speaks quite a lot. I mean, she sings songs. Whatever the moose is called in Frozen. No, but it speaks. Does it? I thought it speaks with his voice in like, the dream sequence. Sven. 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 Do dream sequences count? <laughs> uh, D, I didn't make this list. Found it on a random internet website. Oh, the monkey from a poo. Not a poo. No. A poo. <laughs> no. The monkey, the monkey from, from, <laughs> from Aladdin. The monkey from Aladdin. No, but something from Aladdin. The rug. Yes, the magic, magic carpet, carpet is number two on this list. Number three is a film we've already covered. Oh, Dopey. Is Dopey, it? number three. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I'm, I'm basically holding your hand through this. Are you going <laughs> you <are> on? <laughs> number four, not really a Disney character from the films. Oh, uh... Pluto. Very good, oh, very nice. good. Alex, very good. A star. Right. Fifth recent Disney film. A hilarious character. Baymax. No, Baymax speaks. The horse from Speak. Tangled. Uh, no, but that is number six. <laughs> oh, was it? <laughs> the chicken in Moana. Yes. Yes. Oh, hey, hey. I'm glad you know its name. It's because I have the list up to you. <laughs> the cricket was number ten. <laughs> was it actually? It was a cricket actually number ten. Is it a cricket or is it a grasshopper? I don't know. I'm just, it just says... Cricky, so I'm assuming it's a cricket. The name is Cricky. I'm enjoying that Ben's back to like belligerent top five, Ben. <laughs> Time to move on to the ultimate question of what is the best song in Dumbo. Alex, you can go first this week. Ooh, I think Baby Mine has probably got to be. Although, if you was giving my honest response, it'd be Casey Jr. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I, I think it should be this, but it's Casey Jr. <laughs> I do agree with that, to be honest. <laughs> I should pick Baby Mine, but I'm going to pick Casey Jr. I don't want to listen to Baby Mine again, but I'll listen to Casey Jr. again and think of all the happy times I've had in Disneyland Paris. Ben? I'm not even going to pretend it should be Baby Mine. It's Casey Jr. There you go. 3-0. <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't expecting it to come that way, go that way, but it's the right answer. This is going to be a classic twit poll where us three all vote for Casey Jr. And it's the only three votes. 
So that brings an end of today's episode about Dumbo. Let us know on Twitter what you think is the best song. The poll will be up. I don't know how I'm going to fit six songs into four slots, but I'll figure something out. God, can you only do four? You can only do four, yeah. So two have to be dropped. Let's get off Twitter. Uh, yeah, let's all move on to Parlour. I heard Bebo's coming back. It is, yeah. What? Have you not seen that? He's taking. He's like a war against Facebook. <laughs> Big step backwards. So what is our Twitter handle, Alex? TSFTMPod. So you can help the podcast by sharing this on a random subreddit. What subreddit should they pick this week, Ben? Oh, the Bet Midler subreddit. Fair enough. Makes sense. <laughs> when do they ever make sense? <laughs> <laughs> you can also help us on Patreon signing up. It's one pound a month or one dollar fifty cents wherever we are in the world. It really helps us out. Not as much though as Alex giving us a five star review, right? That's right. Right, Ben? Right. Just a side note, neither of those two have actually given the podcast a five star review. Uh, I have. Have you though? No, no, I don't. Yeah, I don't think so. I believe in being honest in my reviews. <laughs> And, and nowhere lets me give six stars. <laughs> yeah, my... <laughs> Just put the additional star in the comment. No, no, no. I'm not Five gonna... plus one. I haven't got something good to say. <laughs> Five plus one. So all I have now is to do some goodbyes. So it's goodbye from myself, goodbye, and goodbye from Alex. I could stand the sight of worms and look at microscopic germs, but technical epacoderms is really too much for me. And goodbye from Ben. Time for lemonade and cracker jack. Casey Jr.'s back. <laughs> so goodbye, everybody. Bye. 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 I'm finally Casey Jr.'s in Kronk's new groove. I've not seen it. What, the train or the song? The train. I'll have to watch it on Disney Plus. Sponsor us. Peter.